Okay, morning. Uh, yeah, so this is the one we were supposed to have on uh, Monday, uh, but it's an interesting one. So I thought we might as well get it out of the way. I'm just trying to find out where can I put it. Uh, maybe that book is old enough. Ah, there we go. I'll just get it out. Of so it's an interesting one because we're not just going to learn about. Uh, the ECG. I actually wanted you guys to learn about the management of this particular condition because it's something you learn about all the time. We will see all the time why we're in A and E. All right. I just want to share this with the guy. I'm talking too soft, just let me know. All right. Okay. Uh, all right. Okay, so let's start. Let me just get the slideshow going. Okay. Come on. Sorry, computer's a bit old now. All right, there we go. Okay, so let's have a look at this. So what's something else? Tacky, very good. All right, so the rate is just about about one thirty somewhat actually, all right, close to one fifty. Uh, so already we know more or less what we we're dealing with, all right. So we know we've got a rate disorder to be okay. First one, sinus tacky, sinus tachycardia, which means a normal tachycardia, you know related to fever, loss of volume, things like that. Pathological ones that you know, tachycardia. So ventricular tachycardia, very good. Ventricular tachycardia, very good, right? <laughs> Other ones? We, 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 discussed, we discussed last week atrial fib, atrial flutter, multifocal atrial tachycardia, all right? So these are some of the common ones, all right? Then you get less common ones, you know? No, don't worry, we just started. I can, just start. So you get less common ones as well. You know, you get uh, things like SVT with emergency, and you get atrial fertile with uh, what you call it, uh, altered transmission. So there's a lot of them, but these are the most common ones, right? So we know we're dealing with either SVT, sinus tachycardia, ventricular tachycardia, AF, A flutter, all of these things. So first, let's start. What's the difference between ventricular fibrillation and the rest? Just so that we can already rule it out. Broad complex is very good. VFib is broad complex. We know immediately we're not dealing with a VFib. And with the sinus tachycardia, we're supposed to have a normal rhythm because the normal sinus tachy. So it means that, uh, let me just go to the big one, sorry. Sinus tachy, the first thing that we always assess when we're looking at rhythm is what? P waves, isn't it? So what's the first thing that you notice on this ECG? On this rhythm stroke, no P waves. So we know it's not a VFib. We know it's not a uh, sinus tachycardia. So it means we're either dealing with an SVT and atrial fibrillation or uh, atrial flutter or uh, what you call it multifocal atrial tachycardia. So let's go through each one of them one by one. Okay. And then we'll see. So multifocal atrial tachycardia, what did we say the thing is? Multifocal atrial. So that means you need to have multiple different types of P waves. What don't we have in this ECG? P waves, right? So we can never be MAT, all right? With AFib, what's its defining characteristic in terms of regularity? Completely irregular. And how's this one? Completely regular, all right? And with atrial uh, flutter, what's the common thing that we see? Flutter waves or P waves. And what don't we have here? P waves. So what's the only one left standing? SVT. So quite easy now to understand what's an SVT, all right? So an SVT has no P waves, narrow, complex, and extremely regular, extremely regular. Always remember that, right? So we've skipped one or two steps. So let's go backwards to just figure out the, the, the axis. So we've got an upward pointing lead one and a downward pointing lead F, uh, AVF. So we have a 
Very good, left-sided axis, all right. So we're gonna go one step further now when you guys are assessing axis, okay. So we look for the most, uh, how can I put it, biphasic one. Which one looks most biphasic over here? Between these two. Uh, lead two looks a bit more biphasic than AVR, all right. So it, lead two sits here. If you look at me now, right? lead two sits here. That's where it sits, that's where it looks right. So if a lead is biphasic, it means that the, the electricity is traveling perpendicular to that. So we know it's a left axis. So that means electricity is traveling in this direction. So electricity is actually pointing all the way up here, more or less to the shoulder. If you had to be 100% accurate, you are looking at 60 minus 90. So you're looking at minus 30 degrees, more or less, all right? Or 30 degrees here, all right? Now it's good to learn all of these things because the normal is from 30 degrees to 90 degrees, all right? Minus 30 to 90, all right? So it's good to know whether you're still in the normal or not, all right? Let's take, for instance, if it was AVR that was most biphasic. So AVR looks from here, agreed? So AVR looks from just about there. So that means that the electricity is also traveling more or less in that direction, all right? Um, let's say, for instance, it was lead three that was perpendicular. Right? Just for example, it wouldn't be in this one, but let's just say, so if lead three, then that means electricity is traveling somewhere in this direction. So that's another way for you to figure out axis, because sometimes you still need to know, is it, it may be left-sided, but is it pathological or is it normal? Because not all left-sided axes are pathological. Okay, so we've already figured out our rhythm, okay. Then we can go through each zone and see what we notice. Right? Because even though we've got the diagnosis, we still need to look for other things that may come out of it. So let's look at the inferior zone, lead two, three, AVF. What strikes you as a bit odd over there? Because we're not, we're not, in this case, we're not really considering ST elevations, ST depression. But what you can, can you see the slight elongation over here? Especially there, you can see there's like a little notch. Hope you can see it okay over there. Not really, sorry. So those little notches imply slight transmission abnormalities. Right? So it means how the electricity is going through the ECG. I mean, through the heart, okay? So there's slight, slight conduction abnormality. Right? You can see it at the top here at the top of AVR, slight conduction abnormalities, all right? Now, these are actually very technical things. I don't want to get into it. I just want to show you so that you can get a hang of it. Uh, if we look at the high laterals, we also see a similar sort of thing, all right? So basically our S wave, all right? So the, the final part, as it's going through the last part of the fibers is uh, showing a conduction deficiency, all right? So there's something going wrong right at the end over there in those bundles of his, okay? Now, do we worry about this? No, that's for the cardiologists when they're doing stress ECGs and they're trying to figure out who needs to go for the bypass this month because they need the extra cash for the holiday in Hawaii, but we don't really need to know about it, okay? <laughs> all right, but the one that I do want to show you is V1 and V2. So what does that look like? Can you see it follows like an M pattern, right? In both of them. And V1 and V2 sit here, right? Which ventricle is at the front of your heart? Right or left? 50% chance of being right. Right, is right, yeah. So it is the right one, okay. So both of them are looking at the right ventricle. Both of them have a conduction abnormality, right? Because this is not normal. V1 and V2 don't look like this normally. So this M pattern, what does it signify? Right bundle branch block, all right? Remember that. If ever you forget what a right bundle branch block looks like, that's what it looks like, okay? So it's only in V1 and V2 because they overlie the right ventricle and it has an M shape. Now this is a complete right bundle branch block, all right? So that's an M. Incomplete right bundle branch blocks look like an N, incomplete M. There's a few ways to look at it, all right? Then you get something called fascicular blocks, which can also affect, don't stress too much. I'm just showing it to you, just so that you're not of interest. Say, if you see a right bundle branch block on an ECG, do not alert ICU that the patient is coming. All right, right bundle branch blocks are common. It's not uncommon. The only reason that we have to pick it out is because does it have bearing on this patient's condition? Is the physician or the cardiologist going to use it? Is it something that we can use in our advocation of the patient, all right? To say that this is also what we found, okay? Right, so, and as we go through each zone, we notice those conduction abnormalities, all right? So actually these conduction abnormalities are quite widespread. 
So what causes conduction abnormalities? Muscular abnormalities, hypertrophy, ischemia, physical blocks, myocardial bridges, channelopathies, da 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 There's a whole list of them. That's why we don't really worry about them unless they are pertinent to the patient's current thing. So have we decided on a diagnosis? We have, isn't it? What is our diagnosis? Supraventricular tachycardia. Yay! And we all go and have tea. <laughs> so let's look at it. All right? So we have a supraventricular tachycardia. The rate is 135. All right. Wide complex. Now, the reason why they're saying wide complex as compared to narrow complex is because of this part. Of it. Okay. But it doesn't fit with what we normally consider wide complex tachycardias, like a ventricular tachycardia, right? But this is why this particular book calls it wide, okay? All right, so the wide complex without evidence of sinus P waves should immediately consider ventricular tachycardia. Okay, that's what it should, but this is not a VT, not by any means. If you've ever seen a VT, you know it is. Treating physician was quickly able to obtain a copy of the previous ECG would simulate a sinus rhythm with a pre-existing right bundle branch block. So uh, most importantly, the QRS complex morphologies were identical between the two ECGs. Therefore, the diagnosis with SVT with RBB was made. Okay, now that's a nice way of saying that the patient did not have a right bundle branch block. The de patient developed a right bundle branch block. That's what changed the morphology, okay? This is not a ventricular tachycardia under any circumstance. Right? They're just trying to teach you something in the book okay, that I take this from. So we know it's an SVT. We know a patient has a conduction abnormality, which is the right bundle branch, you know, which brings up the possibility of ischemia, myopathies. You know, there's a whole lot of things you know, that come into it. The one thing about SVT to remember, it's extremely regular. Always remember that. As compared to any of the others, even MAT, atrial flutter, um, sorry. Right. Uh, the, the difference being, of course, that with the others, you tend to get slight sinus arrhythmia, things like that, or complete irregularity. SVT, if it's 135 like this one, it's 135. If it's 164, it's 164. Just remember that because it's an odd thing to see on a SATS monitor, for example. Even with the SATS monitor, you see 164, 162, 161, if it's one of the others, but this, it just stays there. It just doesn't move no matter what you do, okay? Right, generally the rate is above 150. It's here because of the conduction abnormality, all right? The only other one that it could be is something that we call atrial flutter with two to one. The difference being there you see some P waves, okay? So that's the only distinguishing factor, right? So now you've got this SVT, this patient is not well. What are you going to do? What do you do? Because you can't leave this patient with such a high heart rate conduction abnormality, especially if it's due to ischemia, what's going to happen to the patient? Who goes to gym here? You can see a few people go to gym. You don't have to be shy, all right? I don't want hands to be raised, okay? Because some of your muscles might just break the walls and things like that. But <laughs> if you've been to a gym and you go on a cardio machine, there's a reason why you can't keep on going on a cardio machine or keep on lifting weights or keep your heart rate above 130 for a long period of time. What happens? You get tired, large amount of caloric burn, muscular fatigue, so on and so on and so on and so on. So the same thing is happening to a patient that's sitting down. They're using a large amount of energy to keep this heart going. Majority of patients who have these problems already have cardiac problems on top of it. So you're asking a damaged heart, or in some cases an undamaged heart, to work extremely hard for an extremely long period of time. What is going to happen to that heart? One of two things. Either it's going to shut down asystole, all right, or it's going to fibrillate out of sheer frustration. It's going to say, screw you and just stop working. And on top of that, your patient's energy consumption is extremely high. So over a long period of time, you're looking at a lot of other inflammatory, uh, what you might call it, uh, Ah, there's a whole lot of cascades that started. So I just looked out of my mind right now. So our job now in the emergency department is to bring down the heart rate, all right? So this is where we get to manage. So how do you bring down the heart rate? Catch the patient. Calm down, God says, calm down. <laughs> no, <yeah. laughs> all right, we'll get to all of that now. But you're on the right idea, right? So we have to try and get it down. So this is the algorithm that's followed, right? Currently at the moment, okay? 
When you have a patient with any sort of SVT, let's just concentrate on SVT for today. The first thing you need to know, is your patient stable or unstable? This will determine your next move. So what's going to tell you whether your patient is stable or unstable? These are the few, all right. Hypotension, decreased level of consciousness, signs of shock, chest pain. The most reliable of all of those is hypotension. The reason being, it's extremely unlikely to have a decreased level of consciousness with a normal BP. The reason for the decreased level of consciousness is the decreased cerebral perfusion. It's unlikely the patient will go into shock with a normal BP. I've never seen a patient in shock with a normal BP. It goes against the definition of shock, agreed. Chest pain is due to direct myocardial ischemia from decreased diastole related to hypotension. So in other words, you don't have to ask the patient about chest pain. You don't have to check the GCS. You don't have to look for signs of shock. You just look at the BP. If the BP is low, the patient is unstable. If the BP is normal, the patient is stable. Right. So let's say a patient is stable. What are you going to do? Establish IV access, which you should do in both. But in any case, in this one, it's more important. Establish IV access. Your immediate treatment is vagal maneuvers. All right. What are vagal maneuvers? Can name them, don't worry. Carotid massage, very good. Any other ones that you know? Squatting, that's another one. Generally, these patients, unless they are quite stable, you can get them to squat, you know, that's for sure. Any other uh, maneuvers that you use for the vagueness? Something cold on the head, all right. Place an ice pack onto the head, that's another one. Okay, so there are quite a few vagal maneuvers that you can use. The truth is that most of them don't work for SVT, all right. Sorry, forceful breathing as well, which we're gonna to get to just now. I'm actually gonna show you where we get that now. No, no, you're 100% right, actually. You're not, you're not wrong, you're 100% right. But what I'm saying is in studies over quite a few years now, they've actually find that none of these really work. They're very low efficacy, but you can try them. The, the ice pack on the head, for example, very good for kids. You know, that immediate shock that something cold being placed on the head has been found to work well. Carotid massage, also very good. The thing is, there are some problems. You need to be 100% sure that there's no thrombi in those carotids, all right? So any elderly patient, any patient with atherosclerotic disease, any patient with the possibility of who's had previous neck injury. So in other words, you have to go through quite a long checklist. You have to make sure there's no bruise. You have to do a carotid doppler. You have to make sure everything is 100%. So by the time you actually get to the time of doing your, do doing your carotid massage, your patient's just deteriorating in that time. So carotid massage has fallen. It's very good, it's very effective. The problem is that if you do an effective carotid massage and you place it as a thrombus, you've now given them a CVA. So they've got a well-functioning heart with a paralyzed left side. Well done. You, you get what I'm saying? <laughs> so you can do it and it's a very good maneuver to do. But let's say you do decide to do it. How do you do a carotid massage? Turn the patient's head to the which side? The opposite side that you want to go. Agree? Expose the carotid on that side. Find the carotid and then apply firm pressure for about 15 to 20 seconds. And when you do do it, it does work. There's no doubt, it does hurt. The problem is that if you dislodge a thrombus. So I'm not saying don't do it, but be careful because if something goes wrong, but let's say for example, you get a young 20 year old who's got to say SVT all of a sudden and this patient looks healthy, everything seems okay. You listen, there's no bruise. You even take an ultrasound quickly check. By all means, go ahead and do a carotid massage and it's quite effective, but I'll show you one that's even easier just now. So your patient is stable. You first attempt vagal maneuvers. Okay. If vagal maneuvers don't work, now you have two options. Uh, well, the two next options are chemical cardioversion and electrical cardioversion. So in a stable patient, you, f you first consider adenosine, and then you can give it at six milligrams and 12 milligrams, okay? And then if that doesn't work, you can use things like procainamide, and then amiodarone I'll speak about just now, right? So procainamide not available in SA, very, very popular overseas, especially if you work in Canada, UK. In fact, they don't use adenosine and amiodarone, they jump to procainamide always, okay? Yeah, it's also a much more quality SA node. What does it do again? Um, 
because it's dissociation of a couple of the channels. I was going to check it up if I wanted to. So. <laughs> All right. So adenosine, uh, we'll get to in a little while. All right. So your patient is stable. You've determined your patient is stable. You've tried vagal maneuvers, whatever it is. They've blown into a balloon. They've jumped up and down. You've massaged all the carotids, femorals, pedal pulses, everything. Nothing's working. All right. You now give adenosine. Adenosine doesn't work. You try a second bolus of adenosine. After you've given that second bolus, still hasn't worked. You give a meodoron, for example. All right. So that's according to the algorithm. Should that still not work, then you have to go to electrical cardioversion, synchronized cardioversion. Anybody done it before? I think you did it. Yeah, Tashin's done it with me. Many of you were here when we did one or two. Oh, okay, maybe not while you were. Okay, so synchronized cardioversion, uh, we'll talk about, well, I've got a little video about it as well. But essentially what you are doing is you are trying to stop that uh, depolarization at its peak. So you've got all of these cation and anion channels that are now exchanged, moving along that cell membrane. And what you do is you pass an electrical charge directly across at its peak. So in other words, when the influx of sodium compared to the efflux of potassium is at its peak, is when your depolarization is showing as your highest part of your heart wave, you then stop it. You immediately stop the heart. Boom. So what happens is when you stop it at that point, you stop those peak influxes and effluxes, and it returns to normal. Once it returns to normal, it actually elongates the QRS complex, or it lengthens the time, and creates less of an opportunity for the patient to go back into SVP. One of the most common reasons, and if you don't remember all of this, don't worry, it's just for interest sake, right? The most common reason for patients to go into SVTs or any type of tachycardia is something called R1T phenomenon, right? In other words, depolarization, repolarization happening at the same time, right? For whatever reason, whatever the, the underlying uh, pathologies, the two things try to coincide. And once they coincide, it causes this extreme influx and efflux, right? And that puts the patient into a tachycardia. Okay, but that's just for interest. Right. So the cardio version, how do you do it? Mm. Listen, if you're getting to that point, you should be phoning me, especially if it's your first time, all right? But to give you a simple way of doing it, if it's an SVT, and let's just remember SVTs for now, just for today. You, we, we show, I'll show you how to do the synchronized cardio version. You start at 50 joule, all right? And then you go up to 100, okay? But remember, synchronized cardio version, okay? So let's talk about the drugs, adenosine. Very difficult drug to give. Adenosine is very quickly degraded by plasma. All right. So in the old days, there was a way that we used to give it. We had to have two people. We had to have a three-way tap. We had to have four thumbs. We had to hold it in a particular way, have two types of flushes. Essentially, what we are trying to do is we were trying to have fluid, adenosine fluid, so that adenosine would be protected until it could reach the heart. All right. Adenosine stops your depolarization immediately and then restarts it again. So basically similar to an electrical cardio version, but because it is, um, what you want to call it, so quickly degraded, it used to be given in that fashion. Nowadays, what they say is we mix it with 20 mils of crystalloid and you give it as a bolus, okay? They've shown it's just as effective. In other words, if you couldn't get it right with the other method, it's not going to work with this method as well. So adenosine is, common, is kept in our emergency trolley drop six months, mix it to 20 months, and you give it as a quick bolus. Adenosine will travel through the veins, it will then hit the heart. As soon as it hits the heart, you get no ECG reading. So you go from SVT to T, and what a lot of people do is they start jumping on to do CPR. No, 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 just wait. Now I've seen it, even in training sums, and even when we hear the heart just stops, that's its job, that's what adenosine was supposed to do. The heart stops, everybody, and then, oh, you know? So don't worry, that's what happens, <laughs> okay? So then, Ideally, the heart should start in a normal sinus rhythm, okay? Any older, better one to use, all right? So my advice to you is when you get an SVT in Magadeni a and &E, who is stable, the first thing that you do, take 300 milligrams of, of amiodarone, that's two amps, put it in 200 mils of crystalloid and run it over 10 minutes as a bolus. 90% of the patients that we've had with stable SVTs convert to a sinus rhythm after. Okay, stable. Remember what I said? Stable. Okay. And as soon as you do this, you just see the heart rate 160, 145. And so once it starts hitting the 140s, you start seeing the P waves and things like that. So your 10, your 10 minute bolus is finished. Then what you need to do is keep the patient on anti arrhythmic, uh, anti -arrhythmic uh, infusion. So that's 150 to 300. I would advise 150. Okay. Uh, simply because amiodarone has a lot of side effects, right? 
hepatotoxic, retinotoxic, autotoxic in some cases, I think as well. So you don't want to overload this patient. So 150 milligrams in 200 mils at five mils per hour. Okay, I'm just giving you all the possibilities, but 150 in 200 mils at five mils per hour. Okay, so 90% of your patients will be okay. Don't worry. Everybody remember that point. Even if you forget everything else, even how to diagnose the SVT, just remember Again. this. Okay. Again. So before you phone me at two in the morning, no remember to give. <laughs> That's why I want you to remember it. <laughs> no, I'm joking. You have an SVT, you phone me. But while I'm on the way, while I'm on the way, you can start this at least, isn't it? Before I come and show you how to cardio, how cardio work and things like that. Because most patients will be okay. No, it's happened many times. You must ask Dr. Sangwini. It happened twice with him. He phoned me twice, two times, and he laughed at me both times. Because as soon as he phoned me, I'm coming. He started the infusion. I got here. Dr. Mom, the patient is okay. No problem. I saw the patient jump in my car and I All right. But that's what it does. So remember this. Amiodarone, please do not mix them up. Do not give adenosine 300 milligrams. Please remember. Amiodarone, 300 milligrams. 200 mils, normal saline, ringers, whatever you've got, over 10 minutes as a bonus. You'll just see that heart rate drop and settle down. Once it settles down, you start the infusion. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, adenosine dose, uh, it's on the previous slide. Sorry. Your first dose is six milligrams. And then, yeah. And then, should it not work, 12 milligrams? Okay. But like I say, I would prefer you guys to start with this simply because adenosine is so quickly degraded. And, and to be dead honest, it's even with the mixing, enough of it denatures that by the time it gets to the heart, it doesn't have much. If you give it properly, it works much better than the other one. But the problem is to get it to the heart. Right? So we wanted to talk about vagal maneuvers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So you've got the three-way tap, what they call the four thumbs push method. Right? And that was the one that used to be used. So just to describe it, basically we've got a three-way tap. It's attached to uh, what you call it. You've got your adenosine on one side. Um, yeah, you've got your adenosine, you've got your outlet pipe, and then you've got another flush as well. Right? So in your outlet pipe, you've got fluid. Okay. So somebody has to hold the tap very, very thoroughly, and somebody has to hold the two uh, syringes together. You push your adenosine, and then you push the flush. The problem is that what many people don't know how hard you have to hold things. So what happens is we push adenosine, it gets pushed into that syringe, and we push this one too quickly. So that's why they found it's not a very good one to use. But that is the official one that is there. But it doesn't work, I can tell you. We've tried it many times with three-way taps. Even if you try and do it 100% correctly, it just doesn't work. You know why? So the most common vagal maneuver to use, let me show you now, is this one here. It's called the revert maneuver. And if you do this, if your chemical cardioversion hasn't worked, this will work. I'm Andy Applebaum. I'm uh, the chief investigator for the REVERT study. Um, and I'm also a consultant at the Royal Devon and Exeter Hospital in the southwest of England. Hello then. Um, I see from your heart tracing that you've got a condition called SVT. The REVERT trial is a randomised controlled trial to look at a method of modifying the Valsalva manoeuvre for the treatment of SVT. I asked you just to get a good seal around that with your mouth and blow hard enough to make the needle reach modification was designed to increase venous return during the relaxation phase okay. of the maneuver and involve laying the patient flat and lifting their legs in the air at the end of the strain phase. Overall uh, we found that patients that were randomized to the standard maneuver only 17% of patients Did you guys catch it? cardioverted to sinus rhythm. Whereas really? the modified technique 43% of patients uh, returned to sinus rhythm. Yeah. Right, so let's go. Let me just show it to you again. Synchronized cardio version using right. lift for a shock synchronized to the R wave of the E. Oh, sorry, that's the wrong one. Let's just watch that again. Right. I want you guys, now you've just seen it, I just want you to see it. It's not allowing me to fast forward on this particular one. So essentially what they are doing, just watch how they position the patient, right? So see the position. I'm Andy Applebaum. I'm going to investigate and then they move the patient. Study. Um, like I'm that. also a consultant sorry, at the Royal Devon and Exeter Hospital in the southwest of England. 
Hello then. Hi. Um, I see from your heart tracing that you've got a condition called SVT. The REVERT trial is a randomised controlled trial to look at a method of modifying the Valsalva manoeuvre for the treatment of SVT. I um, asked you just to get a good seal around that with your mouth and blow hard enough to make the needle reach the top. Modification was designed to increase venous return during the yes, reaction phase of the manoeuvre yeah. and it was uh, the uh, uh, flat and lifting their legs in the air at the end of the strain yeah. phase. So as they hit 15 seconds, that's all that they do. Overall, uh, we found that patients that were randomised to the standard manoeuvre... So, we don't have a nice BP machine like that. So we give the patient a glove. We have done it here a few times. We count loudly with the patient. 15, 14, 13, 12. So they also have motivation. They know how far they have to go. So they are sitting up, blowing into this thing forcefully, as forcefully as they can. And as soon as they hit 50, somebody's standing at the feet, somebody's standing at the head. And we just do that. Okay. And as soon as we do that, heart rate just drops immediately. It really increases venous return quite amazing. Hi, Doc. Were you following us on Zoom? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, okay. No, no, it's fine. Right. So, remember that. The first time... Sorry, Okay. So, the first time you need to do it, the first time you suspect that you... This is a patient that I want to do it on, you call me and we do it together. All right. And it's amazing. It's wonderful. When you see that patient suddenly relax, they feel better and their heart rates really drop. You get somebody from 160, all of a sudden at 80, 85, comfortable breathing properly, completely out of it. Right? But remember, stable patient. Unstable patient, you go immediately to synchronized cardioversion. With synchronized cardioversion, you deliver a shock synchronized to the R wave of the ECG being monitored in wave sector one. You can monitor and perform a synchronized cardioversion through the multifunction electrode pads or external paddles. Or you may choose to monitor the ECG through monitoring electrodes connected to a 3, 5, or 10 lead ECG cable with the energy delivered through the pads or paddles. In this case, we'll assume we have prepared for both monitoring and synchronized cardioversion using the multifunction electrode pads and have a clear signal and large QRS complex. With the therapy knob in the monitor position, press the sync button to activate the sync function. This message appears. Confirm that the sync marker appears oh, sorry. with each R wave. Turn the therapy knob to the desired energy level setting. Press the charge button on the MRX. Make sure no one is touching the patient or anything connected to the patient. Press and hold the shock button on the MRX. A shock delivers on the next detected R wave. Okay, sounds simple enough, isn't it? You can deliver additional synchronized shocks simply by pressing the charge and shock buttons again. Disabling the sync function is as easy as pressing the sync button. So our machine is ever so slightly different in that it doesn't have a dial for sync, doesn't have a button for sync. When you are in your uh, default mode, it has a little uh, display at the bottom that asks you if you want to enter sync. So you press that. You get the exact same thing. You get a little white marker above each R wave. Okay. Now the difference between synchronized cardioversion, normal cardioversion, when we're just defibrillating a patient, as soon as you press your shock buttons, the shock is delivered. The difference with synchronized, it may wait just a split second. So in other words, you can't boom do that. You have to boom and hold until it delivers, okay? Now, the first time you need to do it, I don't expect you to know, right? This is what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna synchronize. You call, I come, I show you, okay? But it's a good thing to try and learn. So that's the end of our presentation today. I hope you guys will take away at least how to use amiodarone, at least how to diagnose an SVT, and at least that you know that synchronized cardioversion is needed. The last question, and the one thing that I didn't want to put on this because it becomes too technical then, what happens if this doesn't work? At 50, I go to 100. If at 100 doesn't work, I go to 150. Now, if I'm going to go to 200, I'm frying my patient. So, what do I do? That's a question. How do? What's the next step? 
in tachycardias. So the next step in tachycardias is something called overdrive pacing, all right? This is just for interest sake, please do not remember this. Essentially what we do is we place external pacing pads. We capture the heart, all right? So we adjust our electrical voltage until we are in charge of the heart. We then push the patient's heart rate above what it currently is. So if it's 170 or 180, we take the patient up to 200, 210, 220. We make sure that we have captured the heart, both electrically and in terms of rate, okay? So we push this patient up. And once we've got control of the heart, we slowly bring it down. It doesn't sound like something we can do in the emergency department because it's not done in the emergency department. It's done in ICU. So don't feel that, that's it, I'm done. There's nothing I can do at writing out the BI because the synchronized cardio version didn't work, all right? There are things that can be done, okay? And for some patients, they do need even more uh, advanced. So for example, uh, what you call it, uh, transvenous pacing. All right, transvenous spaces with a similar type of action, all right? things like that. So there's a lot of things that can be done. Don't just assume that the patient is going to. Any questions? Anything you want to know? I would say you give one at 50, one at 100, and one at 150. If it's not working, then it's not working. Once you're going over 150, like I say, you're just frying the heart. You're not actually doing anything to the heart as compared to others. Biphasic, biphasic. Every new machine is biphasic. Monophasic mach machines are those old, old, old machines. You do still find some here and there, but those are the ones that are collecting dust in a corner. If you see any new machine, generally it's biphasic. I think bi monophasic was phased out in the late 80s, early 90s. So there's not many of them that are around, and even those that are around, I mean, just repair because there's no parts in that for them. So you will find biphasic. But the most important thing, because SVTs are something you are all going to see this year, I can promise you it's a common condition. Remember, identify it, determine if it's stable or unstable. If it's stable, decide what maneuver you're going to do, the revert maneuver most commonly, know how to use your drugs. And if it's unstable, know that you need to do synchronized cardioversion. Remember my speed dial, and then we sort it out. Okay. So it's actually quite easy. SVTs, once you get the hang of them, they're quite easy. Jashin will tell you, how many have we cardioverted now? Enough, eh? Since that? Okay, I remember a few because I get called for all. I don't know how many you were there. <laughs> okay. So we've had quite a few, all right? So chances are all of you will meet one. Yeah, we haven't had any this year, which is quite surprising. I think you were there for a few, yeah, but I did come out at night. Maybe COVID is a natural antidote to SVTs, I don't know, but we will get some, okay. All right, and the reason why I mentioned call is because you remember, like I told you, there's others that we get. So what you may be diagnosing in it as an SVT, I mean, it can be something else. I don't, and there are some certain subtleties that come up like one in a thousand cases, you know, and I don't want you to do the wrong. So that's why I say rather call, even if you're confident, just call. Let me have a look at the ECG, you know, I'll be not sure. Okay, all right. Any other questions, anything else you want to know? All okay, all right. Thanks guys, I appreciate it. I hope you guys are up for tomorrow one more. We're gonna do facial trauma. And uh, I keep on, I see Mkadi Mkunazi, you're sitting here, it's not compulsory. You could have gone home and slept because I'm gonna publish the video now. So, you know, even tomorrow that's up to you. <laughs> okay, all right, so don't stress. Okay, all right guys on uh, Zoom, anything that you all want to ask or know about? I haven't looked at the chat, so oh, there is something in the chat, sorry. Uh, Okay, you all need to mute your mix. That was quite some time ago. But if there's anything else that anybody would like to ask or share, or everybody's okay? Mm. Okay, seems all right. All right, guys, we'll end there today. And uh, yeah, back to work. All right. Okay, I'll meet you guys there in a little while as well. Okay, thanks. Bye.